Yeah, my name is Kevin Curtin. I'm a staff writer at the Austin Chronicle here in Austin, Texas. And I mostly write about music, but I also write about cannabis uh, and <clears throat> strange elements of Austin's culture. I grew up in northern Michigan uh, in a pretty remote microscopic place. When I was old enough to move somewhere, I moved to Lansing, which is the capital city. And it's kind of like a industrial wasteland type town with a college in it. And that's when I uh, learned to start writing. I did, <clears throat> I did a, a zine called Rats and the Speakers. Anytime people would come and play in a basement or come and play at Max Bar or come and play a cool show in Detroit, I would, uh, I would kind of kidnap them after they played and, and ask them questions and then usually just publish like a Q and A style interviews with, with people. And that's how I learned, uh, that's how I learned how to write. And, uh, and that took me absolutely nowhere as a professional writer for the ensuing, uh, probably about eight to 10 years. I was just a musician. Uh, I traveled a lot. I hitchhiked around the country two and a half times. I lived in a camper with my girlfriend and traveled around the entire perimeter of the U.S. and did medical studies for money and continued to write the entire time and send it to people and almost was never published, definitely was never paid. Uh, when I moved to Austin, I was still living in my camper and I got a job at Planet K, which is a head shop, and Margaret Mosier, who's one of the probably the best one of the best journalists in Texas history, definitely an icon of, of female journalism in Austin, Texas. Uh, she would come in there uh, occasionally to shop or for meetings uh, that she was having at the museum next door. And I would bug her about the Chronicle and like talk to her about recent stories that she read or that she'd written and, uh, and play music try to play cool music on the store stereo so she'd be impressed with my musical taste and be like, hey, I'm a writer, can I send you some stuff? And uh, and then that helped me get my foot in the door at the Chronicle. And shortly after I started, I wrote record reviews for maybe a couple months uh, before Margaret found out that she had cancer and they needed someone to take over the music column. And that's when I took over the, the music column, which I called Playback. I was the, I think the seventh person to write it in like a 30 some year history. And, and scene columns are, are pretty rare in alt weeklies. All, all the alt weeklies that are still around, they still have music sections, but uh, none of them that I've found have like a, a reoccurring uh, scene column. So I took it real seriously and would you know, sometimes like just try to go all Woodward and Bernstein on like a club opening or closing or, or like stuff that was happening in music and try to make that kind of my lens of journalism, mixing that with my experiences as a musician. And I did that for seven years until, until last year, at which point I knew that if I was going to keep doing that column, it would probably kill me because... I was up until four in the morning every night, and then I'd wake up at 8.50 in the morning and start writing, and uh, I passed it on to Rachel Rasco, who I think's probably the next great writer in town, and, uh, and I started writing more features. And that brings us to today. Uh, we'll go back, Hitchhiker. Was that a Jack Kerouac thing to hit the road? I, it was a being, uh, it was being bored and, and wanting to see what was out in, you know, beyond my surroundings. And, and at first I had a, I had a cool band called the box cutters that like a ton of people would come out to see in, in Lansing. But like every time I tried to book a show or book a tour, uh, like one time I booked a tour and when it was supposed to start, three of the four people were in jail, you know, or something like that. So I was like, man, I'm still getting out of town. So, um, yeah, I'd go hitchhiking uh, sometimes with my friend Sam, and we'd be gone for months. And that was the first time. It was just an 
to meet different people. And like when you're hitchhiking, you, yeah, you see a lot of like weirdos and you get people who pick you up and want to like have sex with you in a hotel room or something like that. But for the most part, you're getting picked up by like fourth grade teachers who are cool and they want to like smoke pot with a hitchhiker, you know? And so you meet a lot of cool people. And that was actually the very first time I came to Austin, Texas. Um, this girl named Sam, not the boy Sam who I was I was traveling with, but a, a girl named Sam who picked us up said, I have an uncle who owns a recording studio in Austin and he's out of town and we can stay at his house. And we stayed at a house. I still don't know who it is. It's probably someone who I know now, but like we stayed at a house. I know it was on South First Street. And I went to, I remember I, I borrowed like a children's bike from the house and rode it down to uh, Barton Springs. And I was like, holy shit like there's so many cool looking people here like in the midwest you know everybody's kind of you know homely as a mud fence and uh and in austin it's like all these beautiful people people with tattoos like it was just like mind-blowing to me and also the very first day i was here i met uh leslie on sixth street and i came to my friend and i was like dude i just met the weirdest guy in the world oh uh, well i think it was a guy I saw his ass, you know, and, uh, and yeah, that was like, I, I can't think of uh, a better like introduction to Austin than that right there. That was probably in like 2005 or something like that. And I ended up moving here. Uh, well, maybe that was 2004 and I ended up moving here in, in 2009 after traveling through a few more times. So, <clears throat> mandolin and a punk band. Yeah. How, how did that... Because <laughs> that was what I knew how to do because my, uh, my uncles play uh, old-timey music. My uncle Clutch Diesel plays a very awesome primitive banjo style. My uncle Mike McKinley uh, is a lifetime uh, professional bluegrass uh, musician. There's some people on the other side of my family who play uh, Irish music. So... Uh, rather than electric guitars and basses and stuff being around the house, it was always uh, like a, a, a tenor banjo or a mandolin or an acoustic guitar. So, but I liked punk rock, but that's what I had to play it on. And then later when I'm, <laughs> and then later when I moved here, I saw that there was people like uh, like Walter Daniels who I play music with now, and he plays harmonica. And I was like, well, this guy's really good at harmonica, but he plays it out of context. He plays it in like garage punk groups or experimental things and it's like well you can play an oddball instrument in a different scenario and then it doesn't matter like how it doesn't matter then all of a sudden it doesn't matter how many fiddle tunes you know on on mandolin because you're in a league of your own because you're the only one who's like thought to uh to play it out of a marshal or something like that you know so that was that's been my operating theory and uh and it's it's done better than I, I could have ever hoped, you know. I mean, it's very neat, you know what I mean? Like, uh, were you doing that same thing in, in Lansing? Like with the yeah, posters? but I was playing. Well, I, was, I first tried to play uh, uh, a banjo in, in, when I was in the box cutters, but I didn't like it. Was miking an acoustic instrument? I was literally like taping fifty sevens to like a, a, a banjo. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I just. And, and whenever you're playing in something with loud drums and, uh, and an acoustic instrument, it's just like, first of all, the sound guy wants to murder you. And then like, second of all, like if you're playing a house show, it's just good luck, man. But I've eventually figured it out. You know what I mean? Like I figured out that uh, I just use like big, dumb, solid state acoustic amps uh, with, with crazy effects. You know what I mean? That's basically what, what now I can get it as loud as I want. But uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously, 99% of the time someone's on stage playing a uh, uh, a violin, a mandolin, uh, a banjo, they're DIing it into the PA. And I'm always like, well, no, like if I'm playing loud, crazy music, I need wind pushing, you know what I mean? Or whatever. Air moving. Yeah, air moving uh, yeah, the, the sound and stuff. So I want to get into a little bit of like nobody, very few people are from here. 
Sure. And that Which I us, think is okay. That gives us a perspective of appreciation for what is here. Because, like, I was born in Lawton, Oklahoma. I didn't even know Lawton, Oklahoma existed. You know, and then like, you come here, and it's like, oh, my God, culture is real. Yeah. So, like, I mean, kind of expand on that, like, the... Well, also, okay, like, if you're looking for a place with a countercultural history, you're not going to really find any place more interesting than Austin. Because there's so many... There's so many different things that make it up. I mean, uh, from from what was happening in the 60s with, like, 13-floor elevators and, like, people doing some seriously tripped-out shit is... That is amazing. And then the progressive country stuff uh, and, 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 like, when American hardcore movement was happening in the 80s, uh, Austin had the weirdest bands with, like, with the Dicks and the Big Boys, which, like... Uh, you know, they weren't like, it wasn't necessarily like tough guy stuff or just like aggressive music. It was like, it was weird. It was, some of it was gay. There was just like, it's just mind blowing that that existed. And then, um, you know, uh, we have, of course, like amazing pockets of, of, of uh, jazz and R&B. And there's a really, really, really strong history of, of, black music in Austin, uh, from Austin's east side, and from some of the uh, areas outside of Austin, but still in the greater kind of Austin area that that are really amazing too. So, like, you have all this huge musical history, and then, of course, like, the big things, which are, like, the Willie Nelson and the Stevie Ray Vaughan and the Rocky Erickson... I mean, oh, Daniel Johnston, that's like, oh, I would say that's another vein of it, like outsider music, maybe what you call it, you right. know, like outsider songwriter stuff. Um, and so you got all these kind of underground music histories that people actually pay attention to, that people think are worthy of writing books about or making movies about or writing about in the paper and contextualizing over time. Uh, so I think that's cool. And then at the same time, I really appreciate what's happening now. I always am more excited to see like a 20 year old band than a, than a, than someone my age was just 35 because oh, I want to know what the kids are doing. But I think that, you know, everybody's kind of in their, often people are in their silo. They know their, they know their scene. We're all guilty of that. We're all guilty of that. We know our scene in and out. And like, we think the 10th best band in our scene is the 10th best band in Austin when really there's all these different scenes. But like, my goal has always been like, okay, there's already people who do super niche stuff all like in their little world. Like, how can I try to build a bridge of appreciation for all of it? So that's like what I've tried to do. I'm not sure if I've always succeeded, but you know, that's one thing that I think about is like, uh, well, it'd be cool if it'd be cool if people who were in their 60s and people who were 18 both read uh, what I was writing or both were interested in what I was talking about. And you've been you've been kind of what, eight years. Uh, yeah, 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 about eight years. Just talk a little bit about the change, just in the eight years of what you've seen change. Well. What, okay, I would start by contextualizing. What I've seen change in the eight years, I would start by contextualizing the alt-weekly landscape and, like, uh, I guess, underground print media landscape is that everything's dying. Everybody's closing. Like, I know people who work at other papers who used to work with us here, and they went and got a job as an editor somewhere else, and that place just uh, got bought up by a bigger media company and closed down. And... Uh, so I think of the Austin Chronicle as like, wow, this is amazing that we happen to be, uh, independently owned and that they didn't sell it in the nineties when people were offering them a lot of money that they probably wish they would have taken now. But like, uh, but for that reason, we're still open. We're like independently owned mom and pop print and online newspaper thing, which is crazy in 2019. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm thankful for that. Obviously, media is shrinking as, uh, and newsrooms are shrinking as a as a national trend. So I guess I kind of feel like it's more important than ever to do community based reporting because a lot of people do good national stuff, and you can definitely get when I when I write about something that's a national issue, like yeah, like 
hundred times more people will click on it, but does it serve a hundred times the purpose? No, it might serve less of a purpose because like 10 people wrote that story as opposed to like a story I wrote that is very dialed into Austin and uh, even if that's maybe a limited market, it seems like it matters more. That's my theory. Transition to that into 15, 16 year old kid coming up wants to be a musician, wants to be a writer, wants to just be the scene, wants right. to like be in it. Like what what do you tell that kid? Because I mean it's it's a lot like what you said is find your niche, find the story that nobody's writing. That's the uh, same for music and a band. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, because if you tried to do uh, if you tried to do exactly what okay, there's so many good people, there's so many good musicians in Austin. We're not famous for having the most successful the, the the most routes to success of a city or anything like that or the like most connected music industry but there are a lot of uh, really artistic people here and then there's a lot of people who are really good players so you're probably not going to be like you're not going to be able to be king shit by just being really good at something I would say everybody needs to have their own angle and and there are and find your opportunities where you can start playing as early as possible or start doing what you're doing as early as possible because if you want to be a writer you can self-publish now it doesn't matter right and if you uh play music you got to find those all ages spots or and the warehouse shows or a house show or however like however you need to do to start making your art don't wait i would say because uh some people make their best stuff when they're 17 years old and uh and if anybody's like oh well you gotta go this careful route that does not exist anymore like i could see that in the in the 90s or the 2000s but now it's like make what you're gonna make what you want to make and put it out and if that doesn't work change your alias and do it again you know and like and then maybe the third time you're billy eilish yeah <laughs> She makes that shit in her house with her brother. You know what I mean? Or at least for for the what got her popular. Right. Well, then, and to old people, that doesn't sound good. It sounds breathy and like wrong and shit. But like, whatever. Like, hey, ten million kids like it. And what I like about her is she's very specific. Like her target market. That's, yeah. That's the new way. Like, there's never gonna be another Taylor Swift where it's like everybody likes this. That's, if there is, it's not going to be that great. Right. Like, those kids love her. Right. Period. That's good for me, man. Cool. Yeah. I ain't going to fucking listen to it. But exactly. Like, right. Yeah, I'm exactly. It might not be. So right. Yeah. It might not be for. Yeah. It might not be for me. It might not be for you. But, like, if you can be somebody's favorite band or favorite artist, you have something going on. You want, you know? Yeah. Like, that's kind of the point, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then some, someone was asking me about the other day was like, oh, do you think this person would have been successful had they been able to keep going or something like that? And I was just like, what is, like, who wants to be successful? Like, do you think that you have more great moments in life if you're a millionaire from being a musician than if you're a thousandaire from being a musician? It's probably the same or maybe less of a pain in the ass to not be the millionaire musician, right? Like, you can have a extremely satisfying life playing shows to 120 people. Oh my God, like anytime there's a bunch of people standing around listening to your art or like dancing to what you're making or like you're lucky and you're doing something cool and uh, and you should appreciate you should appreciate how, how awesome that is and feel and feel successful. And I think that like Austin is so oversaturated. And I think it's, I think it's good. It might be hard, make it harder for bands to succeed. But like, if you're in, uh, if you're in Lansing, Michigan, or Lawton, Oklahoma, like, whatever's happening on a Tuesday night in Austin is probably equivalent to the best Saturday of the month, entertainment-wise, right? So like, there's a lot of good stuff to see, and yeah, there's a lot of competition, but there's. It's an opportunity. Anytime you step on stage, it's an opportunity. Yeah. Or anytime you put something out. So, just, can you define success as in the music scene? 
It's just not having to drive uh, Uber or do Instacart. Right. <laughs> no, like, I don't know. I used to have VH1 behind the music and like right, right, right. stuff. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Or like, or when it was, remember when it was getting signed? <laughs> Like literally, people just—did you hear? They got signed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like now, that doesn't—that could mean a million different things. Right. Um, Usually means they started their own label. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Or they got signed. Yeah, man, I got signed to my roommate's label that puts out a flexi disc, you know, or whatever. Uh, I think, I think, you know, success. I think success in music is is just having. Uh, Enough people that care about your art that when you when, that you can play uh, that you can play a rowdy show or a show where where people are are paying attention or if somebody uh, if somebody covers a song that you wrote is amazing even if that just happens once or twice in your lifetime it's just like are you kidding me like you know that's it's it's about making connections and making connections with like with five people isn't a great amount of success, but like you shouldn't feel bad about it either. But if you're making connections with hundreds of hundreds of people and uh, and people are paying attention to just what is coming out of your mind, Colin, that didn't cost you anything. It means it's your time and it's your it's your neurons firing or whatever. But like that's pretty crazy, especially in the context of the whole world where so many people have very terrible lives. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's just like, well, you don't... Oh, man, like, you know, I didn't meet my GoFundMe. It's like, well, you don't work in a diamond mine in Africa. You know, or you're like, don't work at a iPhone plant in China where people are jumping off the roof during lunch break, you know? So, I don't know. What is... Yeah, that's... I have a low bar of success. <laughs> that's part of how I've become successful. <laughs> hey, man, low expectations are always there. Yeah. Uh, Kind of go off a little bit on. I mean, you covered a little a little bit earlier, but like, why print media matters still? Because a lot of okay. the kids just for sure, you know. And 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 I'm and I'm 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 totally fine with people. Just if somebody only read what I wrote on their phone, like I'm just happy anybody's reading. But like, first of all, people don't know what goes into print media. Like, it's not just like you write something, you put it on, you put it, you email the file somewhere and all of a sudden it's printed out. There's like a huge system and assembly line of people like, people editing it, people, uh, you know, editing it for content and prose, people editing it for like copy editing and fact checking and then formatting and it's like you what like I didn't know about this before I worked here and it's just like uh, a, an assembly line of people making something so I look at that as just more care was put into it I mean you know I do blogs too there's a lot less work you just write what you want to write and put it on a thing put it on a template and click and go but like uh, I do think that like uh, that that it, it just more care was put into it and then also, when we read stuff via social media, like, okay, when I was growing up, like in the late 90s, I remember like being like, the media like has their own uh, narratives and it'd be better if we were our own editors. Well, we are our own editors now in the social media age where we've made our newsfeed editors, like the, the, the current of news that comes to us is random friends and people you went to high school with and stuff, right? Like, that's what it amounts to. That's your front page of, like, information. And what if we have, like, conspiracy theories and, uh, and, uh, and, like, ways that, like, something can be true, but you can make it look not true, or something can be completely not true, and you can make it look true. And then you realize, oh, well, we don't do any better as our own editors than when there was... Uh, select editors. So I guess uh, it's 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 editing and uh, and curatorial storytelling. Saying these are the stories that I, that we think are important. We're putting them out there, and uh, and that 
uh, voice of a publication, I, I do think matters. I, I've gained an appreciation uh, in working in this field to how it matters, you know? Uh, like Texas Monthly is something, right? Like Texas Monthly, you know, you're like, oh, well, they're this Texas thing. They're not as liberal as the Austin Chronicle. You know what I mean? Or like, or, you know, how conservative, how liberal, how like eclectic or how straightforward, how some publications are very business-like, you know what I mean? Some of them are long form and it's, you get different things out of all of them, but uh, it's, it is a good thing that, it is a good thing that there's more than whether or not it's print is that there are newsrooms because it's just more people caring about what it is. Uh, well, last night, can, can you take me from the process of your article Maybe like the playback article would be better. Uh huh. Because I guess your process is much different now. I assume for writing, but like from Thursday after it's printed to next Thursday, like what's that like to get an article in print out on the shelves? The feedback is more than what you'd expect. The feedback is more than what I expected working for a community newspaper. It's like I always thought I could just, you know. You write something, it's out there into the world, it's out there into the ether, it, maybe people read it, maybe they don't. No. Everything that you write, you will get feedback on. And you'll get feedback in terms of social media, you'll get feedback in terms of texts and phone calls, and you will get feedback in terms of letters to the, letters to the editor, and people who disagree with you, and people who uh, really agree with you, and you don't know who these people are, and that, and that's amazing and gives me a ton of anxiety. And it also makes me not want to be ever be lazy in putting something out there because like somebody is gonna be an expert on that thing that you're talking about and be like, no, no, no. Like that. <laughs> so, uh, so in a way it keeps you on your toes, but also, I mean, I've gotten news tips from people I often get news tips from people who I don't know and they say, hey, I know you've reported about this and this. Do you know that this is happening or something? And it's like, just the amount of feedback that you get from the community is, is really crazy. And that's kind of like the afterlife of a story. And it's a little bit longer than what uh, you would expect in like this era right now where everything's just like the thing of the minute and then we're on to the next thing I you get a little afterglow for like yeah for usually like four days to a week or two where people are hitting you up and and talking about what you wrote uh so uh that and then of course people who just like completely fucking hate on you on the internet which I like I don't, I don't, I am really, 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 really not one of those writers. There are definitely writers who are like, I like ruffling people's feathers. You know what I mean? I'll say someone sucks, even though they're kind of good because I know people will be mad. And like, I don't get that at all. Like those, that gives me anxiety and bad vibes compared to like, I don't, I can't imagine how people get satisfaction out of it, but I, I know they do and that's totally their own thing and I'm, I, that's cool. But uh, yeah, for, for, <laughs> for me, like uh, I had to get like thicker skin because like sometimes people would be like, you know, especially when I first started writing and I, and, and Margaret had been very clear about my history and I'd been very clear about my history about like, oh, I went from selling bongs to writing this column and people really held it against you. There'd be letters to the editor like, now we got a bong salesman who's like, you guys think it's worthy of publishing? And I'd be like, I'd get so down on myself or down on them, I'd be like, well, that's really classist, you know? Or like, why? Because I had a working class job. Like I'm not, I don't have a, a good mind, you know? I, and I would get bummed out about it. But over time I've had thicker sp skin where I can kind of just like be like, oh, well, this person thinks I suck, you know? I mean, dude, I remember one time, <laughs> I remember reading it one time, and it was like, I made some joke, it was like, uh, like maybe about how much, like there's a real weird genuine performance at like Fun 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 Fest, like they did like some kind of 
throwback thing let's book genuine he was just super weird and it was like Dude, i've done a lot of drugs and i can tell when someone's on speed like let's just you know what i mean i just made some like comment about doing lines in his trailer and i remember there's like a letter to the editor next week this is like and it just like highlighted whatever sentence i made about this and it said i really <laughs> I realize that everyone hates this guy, Kevin Curtin, but this line's really bad. And I was just like, everybody hates Kevin Curtin? Like, why didn't everyone hates me, dude? You know, like, uh, and yeah, I think mean, there's definitely those things that maybe you have to get like thicker skin where it's like, and then also realize like, okay, well, you know, I'm just gonna be on this earth for a certain amount of days, so I'm gonna be myself and whatever. Hopefully people eventually come around and like it. When, and I'm sure you deal with it too. It's like you can't trust either of them. The people that say you're the greatest no. ever, no. or the people that say you suck shit. Yeah. Because you're neither totally. of them. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, yeah. Everybody has their strong suits. I would hope that people realize that I work hard and put more time into, uh, put as much time into something as I can, or sometimes like a ridiculous amount of time considering the actual scope of like what I'm talking about, you know? It's like, why does anyone care this much? So, like, I would hope, like, agree with me, disagree with me, think I'm great, think I'm suck. I would like it if, you know, I would hope that people, like, recognize that, like, well, this guy obviously stays up all night writing, right. you know, because I do. So, real, real <laughs> quick, let's hit on the top 100, because, like, speaking of time suck, like, yeah. first of all, you had to listen to all 100 records. Sure. And the well, no, no, no. yeah, listen to 400 you know, records yeah, or so whatever. Like, yeah, talk a little bit about that and like the pushback. The okay, yeah, about that think about why okay, are you still doing this? right, yeah, because it is okay. Like, think of how think of how insane it is. That's what the, the genesis of that was like. Everyone has their top 10 list, man. There's like, I'm always like. Oh, this should be on there. This should be on there. Oh, well, whatever. I'm just going to be at top 100. But then the, the funny thing is that you come into the exact same problem you had with the top 10 where people are like, why didn't I make it? But now it's on a bigger scale because you did a 100, right? And like, if he's like, oh, I'm not even one of the best 100 local records. Are you kidding me? You know? Uh, so it does, it, it makes it no easier. You know, even though it is technically more inclusive, it's also... If you are excluded from that, you're going to be 10 times as mad because you're like, this person didn't, and, you know, uh, and, but what I wanted to get across is that there's that much music being put out there. That is really the point. It's not about like, I mean, I do, I do like really put a lot of time into like, oh, okay, I got to listen to these two records again, back to back and see which one's better and move them around like, like. That's kind of insane, and I do spend a lot of time on that, and I try to listen to at least two Austin records every day throughout the year, but the bigger point of it is that there's, uh, is that there's so much music in this town that's, that I think is good, that I can make a top 100, and I like number 99 and number 100, and I would have liked 105, but like, it, I, there was too many. You know, so it's like have some kind of format to put it in. Yeah, just say every record was good. Every record was good. Yeah. So I mean, and uh, yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, no one like you know everybody like I would like to write me. I'd like to personally thank you for da da da. It's like, dude, thanks for making music. You don't have to thank me for thinking your record was the forty seventh best thing that came out of Austin. It's like I just appreciate that people are making art and I get to listen to it. And that somebody lets me publish that. But yeah, I mean, it is it is not a safe move at all. There's definitely, yeah. Like I said, I don't, I don't, making someone butt hurt is not, does not bring me joy, you know what I mean? But maybe if somebody's like, hey, uh, you know, well, well, you know, like a new band, like, like blood, they're not on anybody's top tens anywhere else in the city or top twenties or whatever. But like, okay, maybe somebody will be, you know, we'll find out about them through through my list, or they'll be like, well, at least somebody cares. You know what I mean? Because like, there's just if you do that, if you do a bigger thing, you can get more new stuff in there and shine a bigger light. For yeah, people. yeah. Uh, but it's definitely a high anxiety week. 
the end of the year is pretty tough for you. Yeah. 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 Uh, this, is, this is the last, my last day of work of the year. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. Uh, I mean, I'm going to be working until, I'm going to be here until 10 p.m., but. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything we missed? Anything you want to hit? I feel like that was a really good conversation. I, I, uh, I guess the other thing that I would say is that, like, I think there, I think that there should be more people doing their own thing, uh, media wise. I never feel like, oh, this is competition. You know what I mean? This person has a new blog. Oh, there's a new website. There's a new, uh, you know, listings thing or something like that. It's like, if anyone thinks that there's competition in media, yeah, there is competition between the Austin Chronicle and the Austin American Statesman because I'm pretty sure the Statesman like literally tried to kill the Chronicle in the 90s by putting out like a Thursday free paper, you know, that luckily did not succeed, succeed. but uh, in general, I think the more, more people who are talking about the stuff that creative people are making is better. There's enough to go around, man. There is way more than enough to go around. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's not like it's not like we all have the same front page news every day. It's just like, dude, there is a million stories to tell, and and that's yeah. One thing I'd get across, or I'd like to get across, is that like, man, if you if you think I if you think I missed a record or an artist or something like that, then write about them write about themselves like we need more people like it's just like dude we have this big society we have a lot of people creating things whether or not it's good is subjective but when you have more people saying whether or not you think it's good you get more of a consensus people start to realize what matters in terms of the zeitgeist of the culture more and that's a good thing so as many people as as can do that like anybody can be the media anybody can have an opinion and i think they should it's just like when you know it's just like oh well if you don't like the bands that are out there start your own band if you don't have a favorite band make your own favorite band same thing with the media it's like and people should have more fun with it yes sweet dude that was fucking great man that was yeah, one of my favorite you. interviews i've done that's awesome thank you sir